In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean. So yesterday, <clears throat> we talked a lot about um, the concept of hiddenness. We looked at the meaning of the heart, and we looked at the life of solitude. We looked at the idea of newness, the internal transformation, what takes place from the new um, attitudes and dispositions that we cultivate within the heart, not so much the external circumstances of our life. And this morning we're going to talk about um, holy silence. And uh, some of the, the points that I'm going to um, talk about in the talk this morning come from a book. I know like throughout the weekend I've been giving book recommendations. So this is another good book that I think um, uh, will um, be along a lot of what we say this morning. It's called Holy Science. The author's name is Father Basil Nortz, N-O-R-T-Z. And the book is actually called Holy Silence. And so I'm sort of taking from um, the content of this book sort of how he outlines what he calls the 12 forms of silence. So we can think about, of course, silence is um, not something that is simply external to us. It's not simply the quieting of external noise. But as we're going to see that the concept of silence as it relates to the interior life, speaks mostly about the interior silence. How do we quiet the interior noise and um, the things that cause us agitation from within? Um, so he, he himself, Father Basil, when he, uh, when he wrote this book, he based it on uh, a number of retreats that he had been giving over the years. And he initially took his ideas from um, a nun from the 19th century who also wrote about these 12 forms of silence. So, um, so we're, I'm using the 12, the number 12 that he uh, recounts in his book as a way for us to sort of outline. So I know it's, there's quite a number of them, but we're going to go through them sort of briefly. Um, I'll just say them quickly. You don't have to write them all down now, but if you're taking notes, I will go through each one of them individually. Um, but the first one is the silence of speech. Number two is silence of the body. Number three, silence of the senses. Number four, silence of the imagination. Number five, silence of the memory. Number six, silence of interior conversations. Number seven, silence of the heart. Number eight, silence of self-love. Number nine, silence of the spirit. Number 10, silence of judgment. Number 11, silence of the will. And number 12, silence of union. So. A lot of these concepts that we're going to talk about are maybe you've heard them addressed outside of this idea of silence. Um, but I think it's very nice how he arranges these aspects of the spiritual life in the context of silence, right? As sort of the quieting of some of these faculties or these um, sort of interior um, storms that we face whether in our mind or in our heart and our emotions and so on. So the idea is that silence is supposed to penetrate not simply a, a sort of closing off of the outside world, but it's supposed to penetrate even our body and, and our, our, sp our soul and our spirit. Um, and what we see is that silence really then becomes the bridge of an intimate life with God, right? That we see that one of the goals of the monastic life Right, is to enter into this deeper silence. And I remember like, during my 40 days in the monastery, I would be surprised that even during Lent in the, in the monastery is already, you know, for the most part, somewhat quiet, and most of the monasteries are closed off. And yet you find the monks will, will go individually for deep walks into the desert. You know, and if you ask them, well, why, if you already, if you already left the world and you're already secluded in a monastery and it's already quiet in the monastery, why, why go further out into the desert? And they would say, because they crave even a deeper silence, right? So the, the, the attraction of silence, once we taste it, draws us into more silence. And in that silence, we, again, we sort of discover that intimacy that we want to have with God. Right? So the goal of this is not simply some sort of heroic, ascetical practice, but it's really about discovering something beautiful that we then begin to crave and desire more 
right? And so the, the, the 12 forms of silence are, are just ways that we can think about how we can begin to put them into practice in our daily life, okay? So, um, another way of thinking about this is that, as we talked about yesterday, um, the idea of the conformity of our will to God's will, right? That really the, the definition, you can say, of, of sanctity, of holiness, of being a saint, is for the person whose will is completely in conformity with the divine will. And we can't know the will of God, we can't hear His voice unless there's that silence that penetrates all of our faculties. It's in that silence that we can more clearly recognize His voice, recognize His will and His desire for us. So the first one we said, number one, is silence of speech. So of course we can think about the great gift of speech that we all as humans are endowed with, that this is something that really separates us from the rest of the created order, right? That unlike anything else in the creation, we have been given this gift of communication of speech, right? And the Lord tells us that this gift of speech carries with it a tremendous responsibility, right? In the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 12, Verses 36 through 37, he says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So we know that many of the Desert Fathers, they spoke about the, the unruly tongue. Right? We read about it in James. You can read uh, the, the third chapter of St. James is um, a very famous chapter about the tongue. And the Desert Fathers, they strove, you know, we even to see, you know, sort of some extreme examples of how they strove to tame the tongue, you know, carrying in their mouth rocks or pebbles in order to sort of make it impossible for them to speak. I mean, they were so um, focused on controlling the tongue, right? And we all know how many times we've regretted, you know, saying something that we, later in the day we look back on and realize that we wish we could take back. So the first step in, in, in silence is that we realize that an unruly tongue, a tongue, a, 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 you know, the, the abuse of the gift of speech, right? And the, gift, the abuse of gift of speech doesn't have to simply mean that we're saying something bad. It could just be that we're saying something useless. It could be that we're simply saying something that's unedifying, right? It could be just sort of somebody who just babbles a lot. Who, who, who feels the need to be heard a lot, right? So, so the gift of speech is sort of the first way we can think of how we begin to, to enter into a more um, greater experience of silence. Um, there's a, a famous book in the Western tradition called uh, Imitation of Christ. I think maybe some of you have heard of it by Thomas A. Akempis. And in there he says, as often as I have been among, sorry, as often as I have been among men, I have returned less a man. In other words, the more that I am immersed in sort of a conversation with people that isn't edifying, that isn't useful, I come back less human. Right? So, there, there's sort of an indication there that too much speaking, too much, you know, or too, an abuse of the, the gift of speech makes us sort of lose that human dignity that we were given. Um, and so the love of silence then, the ability to tame the tongue, gives more power to our words, right? When you know somebody who is careful about what they say, you, then you begin to appreciate that everything they say is valuable, you know. Um, and we see that again in the, in, the, in, in the experience of the Desert Fathers, that many times they, you know, people would visit the Des Desert Fathers and they would try to get them to say a word, to, say, to speak, and oftentimes they would remain silent. But when they spoke, it carried great um, grace, right? And St. Paul talks about that in one of his epistles. He says that our speech should, should be seasoned with grace, Right? And the only way that our speech can be seasoned with grace is that if we practice a sort of restraint. And so that we're more deliberate and careful about what we say. Right? And in reality then, 
we can see that we, we somehow become identified by our words, right? That, that what we say sort of becomes a label of, of who we are. It sort of becomes identified with us, right? So we have to guard against that vanity of speech, um, especially when we're talking about spiritual matters, which could um, indicate a certain um, intellectual pride, uh, certainly speaking on behalf of others. So again, not simply bad speech, which I think all of us obviously know, but even when we can see the example of Job, Job's friends, Right, Job's friends, they, they were sort of uh, presumptuous, speaking on behalf of God. They, they thought that they were sort of giving what God's counsel was in the condition of Job's situation. And what does the Lord say? He says, my wrath, this is Job 42, 7, my wrath is kindled against you, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job does. Right? And that's a very fearful thing, you know, especially for those of us who are in ministry. You know, like... That, that's something I don't want to hear in the day of judgment. You have not spoken well of me. You know, you have not said what was right about me. You have presumed to speak on my behalf. So it, it means we need to be very careful, obviously. Um, and so we need to make an exchange. We, we, we exchange words with men, words with people, in order so that we may have more time to speak to God. Right? And that's the, the positive side of silence of, of the tongue, is that the more energy we conserve in speaking with others, we can put that in our life of prayer. But we also should recognize that, like everything you know, we said, that discernment is the, is the virtue that is so important in governing the use of all the other virtues. St. Anthony says it's the greatest of virtues because of that. And so there can be an unholy silence too, right? We can think of those who um, are short of, show us a, a, short, a sort of indifference because of their silence, or those who, um, you know, give the cold shoulder to others because through their silence, or do the silent treatment in marriage. You know, these are all forms of abusive use of uh, silence. So we have to be careful that our lack of words, our lack of participation isn't also a sign of, of our sinfulness. And speech is necessary for community, for friendship, for, for fraternity, for fellowship, for, for our gatherings, right? So again, we need, to, we need to have sort of that balance and that discernment to know uh, when the lack of words, the lack of participation in community can also be da uh, damaging. The second one is, we said, silence of the body. And what, how can we think of silence of the body? What does that mean? Right. And here, we can think of it as a sort of, again, restraint um, that's observed in sort of the external um, way that we, we act. Right? Because we are a unity of body and soul, right? We don't just speak of the soul independent of the body, but our bodily actions, the gestures, the movements, the way we move, the way we use our body is a reflection of our soul. And so the way we, our posture and worship can be an indication of our soul. Right? Um, we know that when we use our body properly, it disposes our soul to prayer, you know, and if you just do a very simple experiment, if you're, if you're, if you're standing at prayer, right, and you, you lift up your hands, right, it, it carries with it a very um, important expression of your soul, right? If you beat your chest, if you prostrate, if you shed tears, right, all of these are ways in which the body participates and disposes the soul and reflects the soul, right? So there's a sort of process in which both the body is a reflection of the soul, but in a way the body also leads the soul at times. And so think of the silence of the body not so much as a, um, a quieting of the use of the body, but as a proper use of the body, a, a sort of restraint of how our body should be used so that it reflects the soul, right? And then we know, of course, how 
things like music and dance and you know, um, how these things affect the body and how, again, they become a reflection of what's going on in the soul as well. The third one is, we said, silence of the senses. Sorry, this thing keeps slipping. Let me see. Okay. Silence of the senses. And you can think of this, again, as a sort of custody of the senses, right? a restraint of the senses. So we know we have the five senses, right? our eyesight, our hearing, our touch, our taste, our smell. And these are the fathers and the saints teach us are sort of the principal gateways into the soul. Think of them as, as windows to a building, right? Or doors to a building. This is how, you know, we, we receive data. This is how we receive knowledge. This is how we receive images, sounds smell, touch, taste, right? We receive all of that through these gateways of the senses and then they affect us. They affect our soul. They affect not only our soul immediately, but then they become part of our memory. And whatever is in our memory becomes available to use as part of our imagination and our fantasies. So we know the importance of guarding the senses or custody of the senses. And we see, again, much in the Desert Fathers, much of what, what they practice as a form of asceticism is this custody of the senses, this guarding of the senses, right? And so they will be careful to sort of create restraints around things like food and what they see and sleep and what they eat and drink, right? So as to create a sort of discipline of the senses. So the first thing, obviously, is that we need to be serious about removing the harmful things that we take in through our senses. Right? We, somebody yesterday was quoting um, this verse from the Lord in St. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Right? So. The, the, the use of the eyes, but again, not just here exclusive to the eyes, but all of our senses. Right? And so we have to begin, obviously, with everything that's contrary to a life of holiness and purity, things that create violence and disturbance, things that are just create curiosity, right? Great damage is done just by being curious, right? A lot of children will, will, will get into pornography because they're curious. Many adults get into trouble because they're curious about what somebody's saying. You know, we we'll walk by and hear a conversation, and we we'll say, oh, what are you talking about? You know, and, and then that can create problems for us. So curiosity, you know, can be a very simple, deceiving way in which our senses are sort of pulled into um, an improper use. And we can, we can think of how the Psalms, for example, very beautifully in Psalm, um, in the 11th hour, Psalm 122, Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Right? And we just prayed Psalm 24 in the first hour. Um, this was a, a verse that Pope Corlus used to recite a lot. My eyes are ever looking towards the Lord. My eyes are ever looking towards the Lord. Right? So we redirect our senses to a spiritual goal and aim, right? And that's why the church is, um, in her worship, she, she sort of covers all of our senses, right? We, we use the, the, the sight. Of course, we see the iconography. We see the, the architecture of the building. We see the rising smoke of the sensor. We see the vestments. All of this is a sort of beauty to draw us into the, to the mystery of the Lord. Right? Our, he our ears are listening to the chants and to the readings and to the, to the preaching and to, the, and to the, all the worship, the hymns, and so on. Um, even touch, right? We, you know, we, we, we touch the gospel and the cross. We touch the... the um, the icons and so on. We taste, you know, we even, we even taste, in a sense, God himself through the Eucharist. Right? So all of our senses are meant to draw us into, a, the, the use of, of our senses are, draw, are meant to draw us into a way to redirect them into our relationship with, with God. Um, so the eyes, of course, the ears, 
We know that um, hearing is a very important part of our faith. St. Paul says, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And by hearing the word of God, we, we enter into a greater knowledge of the Lord and, and a greater res uh, relationship with him. So we know that St. Mary um, received the message of the archangel. She heard it and she responded to it. Right? And when the, when the gospel comes out during the liturgy, you know, when we, uh, when we, before we read the gospel, we say, wait, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord comes to us two times specifically in the liturgy. First time we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is when the gospel is brought out. And the second time is when? When the Eucharist, right? When, when the priest comes out with the Eucharist, we say, blessed is. So he comes to us through hearing and he comes through us through taste, Right? Through, through touch, through seeing. So all of our senses are, again, employed in this, in this relationship. Um, so custody of the eyes, custody of the ears, custody of taste. Right? We, we, we fast in order to practice that custody of, of tasting. Right? Um, part of um, fasting is not simply changing the ingredients, but part of fasting is also sort of eating more simply, right? So we're supposed to not add tons of flavor and spices and seasonings to our food, you know? We can practice that even in little ways by just putting a little bit less salt on your food. I'm, I'm talking about even in non-fasting days, you know? Don't make everything so pleasant, right? Um, and you can apply that not just to food, but to too many things. And that's a, a small way we can begin to practice sort of this custody of the senses. You know, we begin to just deny ourselves a little bit of the pleasure of, so that we don't crave and, and, and sort of demand that everything be so pleasurable, right? As we were talking about this, we had a wonderful conversation late last night. I think we went to like one in the morning. And we, you know, we were talking about, like Elder Porphyrius was talking about the two ways that we can grow in the spiritual life. One is sort of the ascetical way of fighting against the passions and the other way, which is growing in love for God and love for neighbor. And I was suggesting that, you know, Elder Porphyrius was pointing to the latter way for our generation. Though he was a very ascetic person, extremely ascetic person. But he understood that, and Elder Paisius and Bokro, I mean, all of them, they sort of point to the same thing, which was that in their generation and the generations before, they were, they were a generation that was used to deprivation. They were used to sort of waking up with only a few hours of sleep and working in the land, toiling, the, you know, tilling the land, you know, they were used to sometimes eating only one meal a day because that's all they could, you know, they were come from poor families. They were used to sort of hard labor, manual labor. They were used to, you know, being deprived of, you know, even, you know, um, amenities in their homes. So there was sort of already within them this cultivation of, a, of an ascetic way of life. But the reality is, is that all of us, you and I, I put myself first and foremost in that category, are people that are carnal and sensual, right? And I, and I, I don't say that in the sense of a sexual way. I mean, we're just people who love to indulge the senses. We are people who are very much used to comfort, right? We are very comfortable. We will go to our room tonight and we'll put the heater exactly at the temperature that we want it. We're not used to sleeping, you know, you know, having to shiver, you know, with, with maybe a log fire. So the point is, is that it's very difficult for our generation to be very ascetical, you know. And so we can, but we can practice the little things, especially through this whole idea of the custody of the senses. This can be our way of entering into the ascetical way. Um, so we can even think about custody of touch, right? Um, again, this idea of like always having, you know, warm clothing and clothing that is, you know, perfect material and comfortable to the body, you know, AC and heaters and all of these things, um, again, can create an overindulgence in comfort. Um, you know, it's interesting in the book, uh, Father Basil, he talks about custody of the sense of smell. And he points out something very beautiful. He says, you know, we're not used to foul smells that come from people who are sick. 
you know. But again, until maybe recent times, when you're caring for somebody who has a bodily infection, right, there's oftentimes foul smells that are associated. And we have sort of become, a, we have an aversion now to anything that doesn't please us, even the, in, in the, the sense of our, our um, the, the sense of smell. Right? And so we're, we can even be repulsed from the poor, from the beggars, from the people on the street because we're sort of disgusted by how they look, disgusted by how they smell. Because we have sort of been overindulged in being used to pleasant scents through perfumes and colognes and, and so on. Right? So it's sort of interesting how he points out how all, you know, it's sort of, it's subtle how the, the, the senses can create these problems for us. Okay? All right, so the next one, uh, so we said uh, silence of the, the, the senses. The next one is silence of the imagination. Right? And so we said, you know, the, the, the senses are sort of the gateway, the doors into the soul. And that becomes part of our memory. And we know that our imagination then feeds off of all of that sense data that we've accumulated. And so we have to begin to silence sort of the, the meaningless fantasies that we're constantly living within our heads. Um, and, and, you know, what's, what's sort of subtle again, I'm trying to point out the subtle things, not the obvious things, is that, you know, even in the religious things, even in the spiritual things, right, we have to be careful of how we use the imagination, even as it relates to, like, the Gospels, right? Because nowadays, through the use of media, which is a very good thing, a very beautiful thing, is you have movies about the life of Christ, right? I'm sure if I asked how many of you watched The Chosen, well, most of your hands will. Um, is there anybody here who's, doesn't, who hasn't watched The Chosen? Okay, for those who watch The Chosen, it's, you, you enjoy it, you like it? Yes, yes, yes. Well, we, all, we all find some episodes that are very touching. But it's, it's interesting that through the use of something like The Chosen or I very much love Jesus of Nazareth, if you've seen the, for the one that was done in the 70s, I think, um, is that you begin to, to, to think this is the gospel. You begin to think this is, this is Christ. This is, this, is the, the, this is who he is, right? Rather than it being an image or a presentation or a theatrical um, presentation of Christ, right? And so, you know, we have to be careful that these uses of media, which are good in and of themselves, are not creating an imagination for us which is not real, right? And I've even heard, you know, like somebody give a sermon once and they were quoting The Chosen. They were quoting like the scene of The Chosen, you know, and it, it, it became the source. It became sort of like this is what we're preaching about. We're preaching about that scene of how Jesus acted in The Chosen, right? And of course, with these things, there's a lot of liberty that's taken you know, like in Jesus of Nazareth, one of my favorite scenes, which is not really biblical in the sense that it, the, the Gospels don't tell us this is how it happened. You know, but for me, I can't undo this image. It's the, it's the time when Jesus tells the story of the, the parable of the prodigal son. So in Jesus of Nazareth, Peter is really angry with the Lord because he's going to Matthew, the tax collector's house for dinner. Right, so he meets Matthew, and he, Matthew invites him, and Matthew invites all of his sinful tax collector friends. And Peter is like, you know, he's like angry, he's been drinking or something, and he's like stumbling, and just like, doesn't he know who he is? This guy is a thief, this guy robs us, you know, we pay taxes to him, and he's a thief, and how can he go to his house? And he's really angry with the Lord. And so Peter's like stumbling in the night, and he comes ac across, you know, Judah, um, uh, Matthew's home. And so he's outside and he's looking into the, to the room and, you know, and, and the Lord is sitting around the table with Matthew and all his friends and eating and drinking. And the Lord says, I want to tell you a story. A father had two sons, right? He, he tells the story of the prodigal son, right? And so what is he, in the movie, he's presenting Peter as sort of the older brother and Matthew as the younger brother. Right? And at the end of the story, Peter gets it. And he comes into the room and he starts crying and he says, forgive me, Lord, for I'm a stupid man. And, and then Peter and Matthew embrace. It's, it's a beautiful scene. Like, I cry every time I see it. But, you know, but, and I can't undo, but that's not how it happened in the Gospels. The Gospel doesn't tell us that that's how it happened, right? So, but it's become part of my imagination. I, every time I read the parable of the prodigal son, it's there, 
Right? So we have to be careful also even with the spiritual things about the excess use of media to become the source of our spiritual nourishment. We have to go to the actual sources. We have to read our Bibles. We have to read the books of the saints and the fathers of the church. We can't just even listen just to sermons you know, and, and talks because all of that is, is sort of you know, a secondary source, if you will. Okay, so that's the imagination, right? But there is a, there is a use there is a use of the imagination, which um, when we talked yesterday about the three forms of prayer, recitative prayer, meditative prayer, contemplative prayer, we said in meditative prayer, that middle one, there's, there's an element in which we, in the tradition called Lexio Divina, sacred reading, where we enter into the text and we, we sort of find ourselves in the text, right? So here there is a use of the imagination that can be helpful when we're meditating on the Gospels. Like, for example, Zacchaeus. We talked about, like, I think I used the example of Zacchaeus. You know, we read the story of Zacchaeus, and we don't just read it to know something about Zacchaeus, but we read it to know something about ourselves, right? And so we find ourselves as Zacchaeus, for example, who who then, in reading the story of the case, we look to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to enter into to the home of my heart. I need you to cleanse me of all that is wrong within me and, and help me to begin again and to make, you know, uh, conversion, repentance, and so on. Or perhaps I find myself as one of the people in the crowd who's following the Lord as he's passing through Jericho and I'm not yet committed. I don't know what I re really want in my life. Do I really want to follow him? Do I, you know, and so... Sometimes meditating on the Gospels with a, 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 a simple use of the imagination can be helpful. But again, even then we have to, you know, sort of have some discernment of uh, how far we use the imagination. Okay, the next one is the silence of memory. And I, I think, again, th th there's the obvious that all of us can think of, which is, you know, we, um, last night we were talking about dementia and how, you know, memory really is synonymous with our identity. If you think about somebody who has dementia, severe dementia and has no memory, they really have no identity because everything about our experiences, our, our, our upbringing, who our family members are, our education, our occupation, all of our experiences in life, all of that is who I am today. And so if there's no memory, there's no identity, right? Um, but the the, the opposite of that, of course, is very true as well, which is focusing on certain aspects of my memory becomes my identity and becomes a false identity, right? And so we need to purify the memory by not allowing the memory to sort of run away with us when it comes to all of the hurts and the negativities and, 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 and my interpretation of how things happened in the past, which I view as sort of hurtful and, and you know, wounds in my life. Um, you know, so there's, a, there's a, a custody or a taming of the memory that needs to take place. We have to reject constantly going back to our memory and reliving these, these hurtful or these painful moments. But where we really should employ memory is the memory of God, right? The memory of salvation history. And this is something that the Lord accuses Israel of really throughout all of Holy Week, right? And all of the readings of Holy Week, the, 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 the judgments of the, of the uh, prophets are almost all about this theme of, you know, my people have forgotten me, right? The Lord is constantly rebuking the people of Israel in the wanderings of the desert because they are forgetting what he did with them in Egypt, you know? They're forgetting the Red Sea. They're forgetting the manna. They're forgetting the rock. They're forgetting, you know, the cloud. They're forgetting everything in which God has said, I am always with you and I am guiding you and leading you and protecting you. And every time they doubt, they forget all of those things, right? The Lord rebukes the disciples right after the miracle of the five loaves and the two fish. They get into the boat. They go into a storm on the lake and they forget and the Lord rebukes them. He rebukes them because they have forgotten the loaves and the fish. They have forgotten so quickly that they themselves were the participants in this great miracle, right? And they began to fear and doubt, you know, themselves when they were um, tossed in the storm. So the, the lack of memory when it comes to remembering what God has done in your life, right? Um, there's an interesting practice in, uh, in the West, um, you know, the, in the Western church, they have different orders, right? Like the Carmelites we talked about, the Franciscans, right? There's the, the Ignatian 
um, which is the Jesuits, came out of the Ignatian, St. Ignatius of Antioch, right? And they have something that they practice, um, it's called like a daily examine, right? It's sort of like an examination of your conscience at the end of the day. But it's not just to sort of repent, but it's also, more importantly, it's to, to remember where and how God was with you throughout the day and to make specific note of that. Oh, when I was at this meeting at work and I had this confrontation, you know, I called upon God and I, you know, felt that he guided me or he was present with me or he gave me the discernment to say this or that, right? And I make note of that. I, I sort of ingrain it on my memory, right? Now, what's the use of that is that when I arrive at those difficult moments of my life, when I begin to have those storms that are raging in my life or I go through some doubt or some fear, I call upon my memory, right? And I call upon all of that, that I call it an inventory of, of the, the times and the experiences that I've had in which God was saying, I am with you, do not be afraid, right? So the memory of God is, is the most important use of our memory, memory of salvation history, memory of our personal experiences with God. And this is what the Gospels call a hardened heart, right? Again, we talked about the disciples if you want to look at the actual verse, I'll just give it to you so you can, it's in, uh, you can read Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52, and reflect on it later. Mark 6, 45 through 52, right? And, and, the, and the verse that's important, it says, And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled when Jesus came into the boat. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. It's a, it's a strong rebuke. Right? Jesus is saying they didn't consider the loaves, they didn't remember the loaves, they didn't understand the loaves, they didn't understand what it meant for them in their life to really take seriously what had happened. And that lack of memory became the hardening of their hearts. Right? So the lack of memory of God becomes the hardening of the heart. Okay. Um, so the next one then is silence of interior conversations. Right? And this is something that's very interesting. I didn't think about it until I read it in this book by Father Basil, where he's talking about, you know, if you think about how many times you, in your mind, you hold a conversation with somebody, you know? Like, you know you're going to meet somebody, like, tomorrow for work, and you start playing in your mind, right, the encounter. You know, what, how it's going to go, what I might say, what they might say, how I'll react, what should I do, what should I not do, what should I be careful of, right? And I thought about this and I said, you know what? I have way too many conversations with people in my mind. They're not real. They're all anticipating something. They're all imagining something. Sometimes it's just a pure fantasy of like, oh, if I have this conversation with this person, this is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to respond. You know, and it's a conversation that may not ever happen. Right? And so there's these there's these constant like interior conversations that we have in which we are debating with people defending ourselves against people rebuking people you know and th this is just a constant source of noise within our our minds and in our hearts right so we immediately need to recognize when those conversations are taking place What's the best thing to do is simply, instead of having a conversation with an imaginary person or even a real person that in an imaginary situation, is to have a conversation with the Lord. Even about the thing that's on my mind. Right? Because sometimes the saints tell us, if there's something that's distracting us, if there's something that keeps sort of you know, raging upon us in prayer, a thought that keeps coming to us, and you've tried to ignore it, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is telling you, pray about it. Right? So instead of trying to get rid of this thought or this intrusive thought that's coming in, maybe what we need to do is actually bring it in prayer. Right? And so I'm constantly thinking about you know, my son's exam. And I'm upset that I'm, I'm distracted because I can't pray because I'm thinking, so maybe I just need to pray more about my son's exam and, and give it to God and then move on. You know? So, um, But in the case of these interior conversations, the best thing we can do is to direct that conversation to the Lord, right? And to direct our conversation to the saints, to direct our conversation to our guardian angel, right? It's better to have dialogue with people who actually hear us, 
right? And it's interesting in, 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 in this book, St. Basil says something, uh, I don't know how, if the fathers have heard this before, I never really thought about it this way, but what is it that allows the saints to hear our prayers to them even silently? Because okay, the saints are not omnipresent. The saints are not, you know, filling all things in all places. Um, only God is omnipresent, right? And so you can say, well, maybe they hear us if I say it out loud, but what if I just, if I'm in my mind, in my heart, I, I pray to uh, ask for the prayers of one of the saints, or I'm having a conversation with one of the saints. And what he's saying is, is that, in a sense, the spiritual realm, whether, whether the, the saints and the angels or the demons, they sort of, what gives them permission to dialogue with us is our will. When we direct our will to a saint, then they are allowed to hear our conversations, right? The same thing with the demons. You know, people say, can the demons hear my prayers, my, my thoughts? No, they can't. But if you give them permission, if you direct your will to them, they can. So direct your will to a conversation with somebody who can benefit you. You know, of course, first and foremost, our Lord, the Mother of God, the saint, your patron saint, your guardian angel, and so on. Um, the next one is silence of the heart. And here, when he talks about the heart, he's speaking about it a little bit differently than we spoke about it yesterday. He's talking more about sort of the emotions, right? The heart as it relates to sort of the movement of our emotions. Um, and, and, and the use of our emotions, like he, sometimes they call the... So sometimes the word passions refers just to, especially in the Eastern tradition, refers mostly to the, the, the fallen aspects related to the vices, like pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, sloth, and so on. Um, but sometimes the word passion can, can refer to any sort of movement, emotion, strong emotion that can be good or bad, right? So there's a certain zeal that when it's a bad passion, it's like a, a sinful anger. But there's a good zeal, right, which is a zeal for the Lord, a zeal for justice, a zeal, a zeal against evil, against Satan, which is sort of the same emotion that governs both, let's say, a holy zeal and a sinful anger. Right? So he's speaking here about sort of the, the neutral passions, the neutral emotions. And um, so he's talking about the relationship between our emotions and, our, and, and, and the things that we do to live out our faith. Right? So, um, of course, the Lord, for example, we have the example of the, um, the cleansing of the temple. Right? And sometimes people will use this and say, well, we'll see, the Lord manifested a, a, a form of anger. Right? What scriptures say, be angry and do not sin. Right? And my response is, well, when you're able to be angry in any way that resembles the Lord's zeal for the house of, of his father and not sin, then go ahead and do it. But most of us, of course, you know, it's very difficult to have a, a righteous anger that's not tainted by some pride, some malice, some something that is sinful, right? Um, so we have to be very careful, of course, of the use of our emotions and, and those, those passions. Um, but sometimes the passions or these emotions, they give... Um, they, they, they give additional weight to our actions in a good way, right? So... Um, but the importance here is that we shouldn't be governed by emotions, but our emotions should follow our, um, our right reason, right? So if we take, for example, um, like let's say the act of the Lord in cleansing the temple, right? He wasn't angry and then he took out his anger on, on the people in the temple, but he was doing something according to the will of the Father, but right? he was doing something that was righteous, and it was accompanied by emotion, right? So when our emotions follow the reasoning, the right reasoning, which is guided by the Holy Spirit, which is guided by discernment, which is guided by, you know, uh, the Word of God, then our emotions can, can participate. And so the silencing of the emotions is sort of to make sure that they are ordered sort of... Um, not before, but ant, ant, what's the word? Ant, 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 antecedent? Or is that the right word? I don't know. After the, 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 the reasoning of our mind and our heart. Does that make sense? Yes, or do I need to explain more? Okay. 
Um, the next one is silence of the spirit. Um, and here, you know, this goes to, uh, we were having a conversation, Abun Amina and, and, and some of us at the breakfast table about um, this idea of passive sort of purifications or what sometimes the darkness that we experience, um, which is, think of it in terms of like there's the active way that we practice asceticism, right? So the, the things that we do, that we participate in, I choose to mortify my body by fasting, by sleeping less, by, you know, doing prostrations, by standing in vigil, right? I, these are things that I sort of actively participate in by the, with the grace of God, right? It's not purely me, but, it, but I have a part that I'm, I'm voluntarily and actively participating in. But then there are purifications that are sort of, we could say, imposed on us by God, right? The things that we don't choose, but that happen to us that cause us to sort of be thrown out of equilibrium, right? And sometimes it can be sources of great agony and, and, and agitation for us, right? But the important thing is, is that we remember, and this is, um, again, something that we were talking about last night, in the sort of the informal discussion outside is this idea of sometimes going backwards in the spiritual life is the best way to go forward, right? And, the, and really importantly is the, is the verse Isaiah 55, 8, for my, um, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, my ways declares the Lord. Right? We always have to keep that principle in so many ways in front of us in our relationship with God. We can't always think that you know god is sort of going to going to govern my spiritual life and govern you know uh, everything in my life according to what seems to me to be what makes most sense right and so this idea that my spiritual life should be on this constant progression a linear progression always going up one step after the other right that, those are my thoughts those are my ways this is what makes sense to me but that's not the ways of the lord that's not the ways that he employs even with the greatest of his saints but oftentimes there's times in which the saints go through great darkness and tribulation and difficulties you know and it seems like they've been thrown backwards and yet it is precisely during this time where they make the most progress in, in their spiritual life when they are able to, in this time of darkness, to have a more purified faith, a more purified hope, a more, a more purified form of love, right? Because it's easy to love somebody when everything is going well, right? It's easy to love my wife when, you know, she's always dressed so beautifully and making dinner for me and waiting at the door for me, you know, when I come back from work and right. But when we go through a difficult time, when, you know, when she's not able to give to me, what is my response? Am I still going to love her? Or am I going to pull back on my love because I'm not receiving as much? Right? If you're standing at prayer and you know, you're always filled with great consolations from God, you have this beautiful feeling of God's presence, you find great joy and happiness in prayer, and then you stand at prayer one day and it's totally dry, nothing. You feel even abandoned by God. You feel that He's, he's nowhere to be present among you or near you. Right? Is your love at that point going to be closed off? Are you going to still pray? Are you still going to worship Him? Are you still going to love Him? And so it's in those times when we learn how to actually love. We learn how to have faith when there is nothing that tells us we should have faith. You know, St. Paul talks about the virtue of hope in one of his epistles. He said, it's not even hope until you're really in a hopeless situation. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says that it's only hope when it's a situation that is without hope from your perspective. That's, only, that's the time when it becomes the virtue of hope. So we have to be put in these periods in our life in which we were talking yesterday about these reliances, reliances that we have on our health or our finances, our relationships. Sometimes those things become, you know, troubled in our life. They become agitated or disturbed and they become points in which we learn whether we really believe in God. We really love him. We really are going to trust him. We really are going to put our life into him, right? Um, think about at the end of the Gospel of St. John, chapter, or the end of the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, in the discourse of the bread of life, Jesus is speaking about his body and his blood as food and drink, and it says many of his followers left him. And Jesus turns to the twelve and says, do you also want to leave? And what does Peter say? He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
right? That's the point that these passive times of purification, that's what it's supposed to produce in us. So that we arrive at a point where we have none other than the Lord that we put our trust in, that we follow, that we love, that we stake our life on. Right? And that, that only comes about when we are tested, when we are um, patient in those trials and tribulations. So the next one then is silence of judgment. And here, I mean, obviously we know and the Lord how often he speaks about judgment. We know in the Desert Fathers how often they spoke about the sin of judgment. Um, but it's really, again, learning to silence our, um, the permission that we give ourselves, to silence the permission that we give ourselves um, to make any sort of affirmation that's beyond our scope. Right? One of the things with judgment is that we usurp God's space. We usurp his prerogative. We usurp his role as the judge. We, we basically say, get out of the way. I can do this. And it doesn't belong to us. Right? So there's, again, think of silence here as a, as a form of restraint, control. And um, um, when we do that, right, we arrive at that sense of purity of heart where like St. Paul says to, to Titus, to the pure, all things are pure. Right? We begin to see everyone as, as good. We begin to see everyone as a child of God. We begin to you know, um, uh, silence any comparisons that we make between others and ourselves. St. Dorotheos of Gaza in one of his um, discourses says, Only God who knows the situation of each one of us, our strength, environment, our individual gifts, temperament, capacities, can justify or condemn. He can judge each of these things as he only knows. Right? So the problem with any sort of judgment is, is that we look at something in the moment and we take a snapshot of it in the moment and we say, but it's obvious. This is clearly what's happening. This is clearly how it looks. Right? But th the problem with judgment is that, that the, the Lord, when he judges, he takes into account everything. He takes into account the person's upbringing. He takes into account their struggles. He takes into account you know, the, 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 the situation. He takes into account you know, what kind of family they, they, they came from. He takes into account you know, what grace he's given them. Right? We, we were talking yesterday about the story of St. Bishoy, right? St. Bishoy was questioning this young monk who could barely fast for two days while St. Bishoy was going for 21, 22 days of fasting. And the angel revealed to him, he says, well, you're fasting for 22 days because God gave you the grace to fast for those days. But actually, this young monk is even more great in God's eyes because he's doing much more with the grace that he's been given. You know, so... If, if St. Beshoi is going to make a judgment between himself and a, a young monk because one is fasting for 22 days and one for one or two days, right? we see how the angel shows that it's not as it looks. It's not as it seems. So we have to silence um, any judgment, even the obvious things that are in front of us. You know? And it doesn't mean that we don't discern right from wrong. It doesn't mean that we don't, um, in our workplaces, have to make decisions, you know, to employ people or let people go, right? I mean, these are things that, you know, a judge that sits on the bench has to make, obviously, a judgment according to the law. Um, but what we're talking about is making a judgment about a person's soul, making a judgment about a person's condition before God, making a judgment about a person's relationship to God, making a judgment about how God looks at a person and sees a person. And, you know, and oftentimes we, we presume that, well, God must look at this person the way I look at them because they're obviously, you know, this or that. Um, okay, so the next one is silence of the will. And here we can think of it in terms simply as the denial of our own self-will in order to conform our will to the will of God, right? To, to say, like the mother of God, let it be done to me according to your word. Or like the Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Right? It's this constant denial of a self-will that is in opposition to the will of God. The will of God is always the path, not only to a life of holiness, but to our happiness. Right? And even at times when it seems that God's will for us is harsh, or that it's leading to our destruction, 
right? We, 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 we arrive at a point through that life of faith, hope, and love in which we come to love and seek the will of God, knowing that it's the best thing for us. Right? So one of the saints said, I would rather be a vile worm by God's will than to be one of the seraphim by my own will. Right? I would rather be a vile worm by God's will than be one of the seraphim by my own will. Right? So can you compare a vile worm to a seraphim? Of course, the seraphim is greater. But if it's not in accordance with God's will, it's worse. So we, we think, can think of the will of God, of course, in, in the obvious um, things that he commands us to do, especially the commandments, the Beatitudes, the evangelical counsels of the gospel. Like all of the teachings of the Lord are, are things that we can begin to practice his will without debating, discussing, discerning. Right? We don't need to discern whether God wants us to love our enemies. It's not easy, but there's no question as to it being the will of God or not. Right? Um, so there are things that we, 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 we begin to practice in terms of the will of God so that we arrive at a disposition of heart that we can hear the will of God for us and the things that are personal. Right? So there's, there's the will of God that's stated clearly in, in his word and in, in the teachings of the church in you know the obedience let's say that is given to in the monasteries um, uh, from the abbot or the, the spiritual father to the to the monks or to the nuns right so there's there's the word which is without question especially of course the the, the gospels and then there's sort of the word that's given to us every day of our life that governs the, the, the providential things that we encounter, right? What to do at work with this person, you know, what job should I take, what school should I attend? All of these things become very important details in our life. But the more we practice the stated will of God, the more we, we begin to really struggle to employ the, the will of God and the things that we know we have to do, the more sensitive we become to hearing the will of God for us in the moment, in the present moment. Right. Um, we talked yesterday about Faustina, the Polish nun. In one of her diary um, entries, she, write, she wrote the following um, um, vision that she had. She said, Then I saw the Lord Jesus nailed to the cross. When he had hung on it for a little while, I saw a multitude of souls crucified like him. Then I saw a second multitude of souls and a third. The second multitude was not nailed to their crosses, but were holding them firmly in their hands. The third were neither nailed to their crosses nor holding them firmly in their hands, but were dragging them behind them and were discontented. Jesus then said to me, Do you see these souls? Those who are like me in the pain and contempt they suffer will be like me also in glory. And those who resemble me less in pain and contempt will also bear less resemblance to me in glory. Right? So there's those who were on the cross with him. Those were those who were holding the cross firmly, but not on the cross with him. And then there were those who were dragging the cross and they were discontented. Right? So we choose whether we want to carry the cross of following the will of God, choosing the, the saying yes to the things that he chooses for us. Um, all right, just to be um, respectful of your time, the last one then is number 12, is silence of union. And this one is, um, is really not a form of silence as we understood the previous 11, but we can say that this is really the culmination and the goal of all of the forms of silence. It's the silence of entering into union with God and resting in Him. Right? So it's sort of really pointing to the goal. It's pointing to, you know, glimpses of what we might experience in this life, but ultimately it's what we're going to experience in eternity with Him, where all of our striving, all of our efforts, all of our, 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 our sorrows and, 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 and trials, everything is now culminated in just resting in that union with Him. And, and there's a form of, of silence in that. There's a, a sense in which that's a, the silence of, you know, again, resting in the bosom of God forever. But we can, we can experience a little bit of that even now at times when we just rest in that silence of God in our prayer life. There's a beautiful story um, that I often um, recite about uh, uh, a famous uh, French uh, priest. His name is St. John Vianney. It was in the, I think, 18th, 19th century. And um, 
St. John Vianney was a parish priest in this village in Ars, France, and he used to see this farmer, this peasant farmer, come in every day, you know, place his, um, his uh, tools at the door of the church, and he would sit in the very back of the church, and he would just silently look at the uh, crucifix above the altar. But he wouldn't, um, St. John didn't see him praying, he didn't see him moving, he didn't see him doing anything. And, you know, day after day he saw the same pattern and he came to him and he said, you know, every day you come in and I see you do the same thing, what are you doing? And the man looked at him and he said, I look at him, speaking of the Lord on the cross, said, I look at him and he looks at me. And the two of us are happy. Right? So, this idea of just resting silently in the presence of God, right? It's, it's a time of no more struggle, no more striving, no more, like, effort, but just moments of rest, right? And everything is quieted within and without, right? And, you know, again, I pray that I and you have those moments in, in this life, but this is also what we're working for. This is what eternity will be. It will be that silence of of the union, of being one with God. Saint Isaac the Syrian says, silence is the language of the world to come. Silence is the language of the world to come. It's when all of our longing, all of our desiring, all of our striving gives way to possessing he whom we seek and love. And this is the, the perfection of silence. Okay, so silence of self-love, um, when we think about self-love, of course, we think about the disordered self-love, right? It's the, it's the selfish, the ego, which is um, a sort of disease of, of, of the fall, right? There is a self-love which is proper to, uh, properly ordered, which is why the Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself. So there is a form of self-love, which is to love ourselves in God, to love ourselves as is created, you know, being that has been given the dignity of, of being in his image and likeness. It is the self-love in which we acknowledge all of the gifts and talents God gives us. We don't deny them. It's the self-love in which, you know, we, we accept the, the callings that God calls us to, even great and wonderful things. But it's, it's a self-love in which we always see ourselves in relationship to God, right? We're never independent. We're never seeking something outside of Him. We're never, it's not, never something that's outside of, like we said, about His will. Um, so there's the egotistical self-love, which is the gratification, the, the constant gratification of the self, clinging to our rights and our, our dignity and reputation and our comfort, right? And we can sense um, that this self-love exists within us. Of course, as soon as somebody criticizes us, as soon as somebody um, hurts us, Right? We see sort of that self-love rise within us very, very, very powerfully and very easily. Um, so it's really about silencing that self-centeredness. Right? How, do I, how do I accept that I am a, a son, a daughter of God, with given this, this beauty, right? but only in my relationship to God? Without God, I, as we said, we were talking about last, you know, last night, I'm, I, I don't even have the ability to exist. Right? My existence depends on God. My dignity depends on God. All of the gifts and talents I have depend on God. Without that relationship with God, then that independence is what is sort of at the heart of the fall. Right? Adam and Eve are sort of called by Satan to like take matters into their own hands and to not trust God, that he's sort of holding something back from them. Right? And that's sort of the beginning. And so the most important thing is, is to learn how to relinquish sort of our personal rights and reputation and everything that we, we think is sort of um, a form of justice towards us for the sake of love, for the sake of love. Right? Jesus himself is the perfect example of this, that he denied himself, he denied himself in order that he might love us to the end, right? as the Gospel says, St. John. He loved those who were in the, he loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. Right? He didn't hold anything back for himself. He didn't claim any rights for himself. He didn't claim any justice for himself. He didn't claim anything for his own dignity, but he gave it all for the sake of love. Right? And that's the path for us: is that um, you know, 
learning to accept sometimes the injustices and the hurts of things in our life can be a way that we begin to practice that letting go of the self. Now again, with discernment, right? We're not called necessarily to be doormats for everybody, but we are called at times to give up our rights. And this is very contrary to sort of the ways of the world, which tell you to hang on to every single right and you know, and you know, just to be willing to sort of die for those rights. And I think we as Christians need to take a hard look at sort of the, the spirit of the world and the spirit of Christ when it comes to this idea of our personal rights. So maybe we'll leave it there and we can have more discussion about it another time. Thank you so much for putting that out. But I think we can delete this this recording because I just ruined it by getting out of order. So <laughs> thank you. Glory be to God. Thank you.